All right, so today's uh, March 28th, 2021, and this time we're doing our actual Desiderata Extinctionati meeting. Um, how did you want to do this? Did any reactions to uh, Lear, Keith's interview? Um, what do you want to discuss right now? Yeah, yeah, let's discuss that. Can I uh, say something about Lear's yeah, start there? Um, I mean, if she's coming back, we can probably talk to her about it. Um, but I was thinking about um, even if all the heirs' dreams came true, um, we still lose a lot of human beings off the planet in a fairly short period of time. Um, uh, and that's going to happen anyway. Um, but I, I don't know... Uh, Sophie, have you read her book? Does, does, does she actually touch on that at all? The, the kind of realization that people have got to come to that uh, there's a bottleneck um, that, that humanity is approaching, and and like uh, um, I don't know. Can I just ask that? Does she address that at all in the book? Do you know? I don't. I can't remember that. I can remember that on the other writers of the book I read, which was Deep Green Resistance. I think Derek Jensen yeah. is a bit more of a, a doomer. I, I I can't recall. I'd have to I'd have to look again. Um, Lear, yeah, um, so um, abrupt about our future. Um, I I can't answer that question. I don't know. We'd have yeah, to ask. Her. I don't know. I, I yes, I yes, I knows. know. If she comes back. Um, but uh, maybe she plays because, with the idea. Because she says. That radical action. She said it when she was talking. She was saying, you know, she agreed. If if we had time, we could do that. I mean, we, we don't have time. So I think she. I don't. I don't know where she is in that in that line at all. No, she seemed a little bit contradictory, because on the other hand, she was sort of going on about the grassland reclamation and all this kind of thing. Is so it was a long term project that there was some possibility that we'd actually go through with. But even if it did happen. Um, you know, I mean, you've got billions of human beings currently laying claim to that land for other yeah. purposes who are not going to let it go. Uh, she's a farmer and she needs, she needs long-term, I mean, mm. you know, if, if, if you are on a project and if you, if she, if she's really wanting to do what she's doing, I suppose she needs to think long-term, even having at the back of her mind that it might be futile. Do you know what I mean? Oh, well, of course, yeah. I mean, I guess it's that sort of principle of doing the best you can, even though, um, you know, you might not get to some dream. Um, sorry, I, I'm not being very articulate. I, I was. Do, well, I think what I was trying to get to was that I think it's an important part of the entire story to lead people to really get it that a lot of people are going to go and they're going to go no matter what the scenario is. Um, and that that's, I think that's probably the beginning of getting people more serious about what they're doing, how they're behaving. Um, you know, it's a bit like what Hugh was saying about XR, that like 50% of the people he polled were uh, still talking about 2100, you know, um, it, it, there's this is real schism between uh, uh, people who think there's a reasonably long future in which some something can be done, and people who who are just uh, um, you know absolutely looking at a short term, um, you know certainly civilizational collapse. Um, so, do you want to come in, Sophie or Hugh? Because I'm, I'm not being very articulate at the moment. Can you pick up on on, on what I'm doing, I, what I'm saying? Yeah. Do you want to talk, Sophie? But so I think we'll have to check with her. But I think that that she and Derek is kind of like we're on the Michael Mann point of view, and that's that. It's we all know we're screwed. It's just a question of how screwed, and nobody knows how screwed we are. So I think the only thing that makes sense is you, you barrel forward understanding that we're all screwed and the civilization is screwed. But 
you try and mitigate the damage as much as possible. So it's not a question at this stage, I think everybody agrees that the train goes over the cliff. It's just a question of what speed it goes over the cliff now. So this, the reason why nobody wants to have this conversation is because it gets uh, kind of treads on people's wokeism very quickly. Because the first thing you have to say is, if you're going to try and make sure that some people have the best hope, who are they? Now, straight away, people start in England, say, where they're all privileged and you know, massively over-optimistic about <laughs> their prospects uh, on a tiny little island. You know, it's just, um, you know, when you talk about refugees, they think of, all these brown people swarming into Britain. And when I talk about British refugees, I'm talking about part of the, you know, 64 million Britons that won't be able to feed themselves. There's only enough land space to feed half the population. So, you know, if you're looking for refugees, they're streaming out of Britain, not into Britain. But, you know, that, that blows people's minds straight away, although it's as obvious as anything. Places like Japan, I think, what, what are they, 120 million or something? It's like that's a very small island to have 120 million people on. You know. And so when you start looking at who are the best survivors, it gets complicated because it depends on your view of, you know, what you can do in terms of climate mitigation. If it's solar panels and wind farms, then all the people in cities survive. My view is the, that the people in cities are the vulnerable ones. 70% of us will be in cities soon. Over 50% of the world's population is cities. And I, I pretty much think that if you're realistic, you've got to write them all off. I mean, this cities, what, what the hell are you going to eat? You're going to eat concrete? It's like those cities will have to be evacuated to the surroundings. I mean, go and look at every situation from Uruk to Ur to you know, all the cities in Mesopotamia that are now dust bowls, you go and look in South America and they all evacuate the cities. They can't, because the cities are a big hub where all these resources are sucked into the center. If those tentacles and lines of communication and logistical channels break down, the people in the cities have to leave and abandon the city. And that's why you find all these abandoned cities. So, you know, if you look at a place like Rome or something, uh, Rome almost got abandoned. It didn't get abandoned totally because there were still some communication routes. There were still some sea routes and stuff. But everything now is so fragile and so high tech. Um, you just saw <laughs> in the sewers. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, the, our society is far too brittle for the cities and those logistical networks to survive. Because if you think of like a plowed field somewhere in America, the corn is not actually edible. People don't realize that. They think, oh, there's oceans and oceans of corn from Iowa all across the Midwest. And you say, it's not edible. You can't go into a cornfield in America, grab a load of corn and start chowing down. It's They've genetically modified it and bred it so that it only works in an industrial food system. They've, you know, they, they, they extract it into about 150 different nutrients. And those all go through, you know, general mills and <laughs> get into your Cheerios and stuff. But uh, they only components that they add, do additives to and they do an industrial process to so you can't uh, just go pick them and eat them out of the field and and also they're too toxic there's, there's some of those fields like idaho potatoes the farmers uh have these you know circular watering irrigation uh, circles for these uh can't remember what these these arms these irrigation arms that swing around in a big circle and then the, those things uh, they absolutely, like Leah said, it's it, they're absolutely dead. You might as well grow grow the plants in in an inert substance. You know, you might as well grow it in a petri dish. It's it's grow, growing it in chalk, in effect. So they have to put all the nutrients in, and they have to put all the pesticides in so that they can get the the yields up. So herb, herbicides, pesticides, and and fertilizer. 
And so it's a completely artificial env environment, but they have to put so much uh, things like herbicides mm -hmm. and, and pesticides in that uh, if those irrigation arms break down in an Idaho potato farm, it's too dangerous for the farmer to go in to repair that, <laughs> that uh, thing. He has to wait, uh, you know, for the next season or something to go and repair it because you'd have to go in there with a biohazard suit to work on one of those, those things. What, what those things rely on is that when they take those potatoes out of the field, they rely on a gap of about two weeks to get to the, the store shelves. And in those two weeks, the scientists say, well, they kind of have a half-life. And by the time you get to the, the, shel ha you know, the shelf, it's got like 10% of its to 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 <laughs> toxicity. And then that just squeaks in under the FDA rules. But if you see that system is, is, is what we have to do to have mass nutrition and particularly in, in the States, corn. So it's basically corn and alpha. Mm -hmm. so, so if you say that, that if that system breaks down, if the guys can't get phosphorus or fertilizer or you know, do the Harbor Bosch process to, to actually feed those crops, if they can't get the water, or if they can't transport these things or run all the mills and factories in the, the food system, the five or six food companies, then, you know, the people in the cities are fucked, to put it mildly. And I don't think anybody realizes that. I don't think anybody's telling people that, but it's well known by the government. If you yeah, look at this is some, yeah. Oh, sorry, go This ahead. is what I'm trying to get to. This is what I was trying to get to, uh, which we might, Get the chance to talk to to Lear about was was getting people to this point where they really understand that kind of thing um, that it's not an abstraction, you know. And of course, you know, implied in what you're saying is the extreme fragility of the system. Um, I mean, I think that that ship in the sewers is just the poster child of the. It's just such a wonderful example of everything that, that's embodied in this, from energy use to to industrialization gone crazy to to hugely to extended security. supply lines. To, yeah, to everything. It just, it's, it, it's it's all contained in the story about that that ship. I, I was quite fascinated with it. You know the way it. it um, do you know if they've actually moved that yet? Is it still there? I know it's still there. I um, yeah, I'm. So I'm I, betting. I, I want pictures. to make a bet. I, I saw some pictures there. Just, just. I don't want to say too much about that thing, <laughs> but the, I, I saw some um, pictures. Well, I they, do. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, like I, I went back and looked at Earth Null School to just make sure about the wind story. It's bollocks. Uh, I went back and then looked at the pictures of them yeah. uh, mining it out, and, and that that ship plowed in there at about as full speed as you can get. <laughs> so it's like, dude, okay. I don't know how because this the is what. Um, do you mind if we talk about this for a minute? Because I, I got yeah, into just, it a little just bit. Just let me close the um, door. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, but it's perfect, you know, the, that bottleneck thing, yeah. Yeah, the thing is, first of all, I want to lay a bet with somebody. I don't think they'll ever move that ship. Uh, or if they do, they're going to have to take it apart. Uh, but what actually got me on to being a bit suspicious was probably something you posted a while ago about the shipwrecking yards in Turkey. Or if it, or I kind of must have got there from one of the maritime web uh, links that you'd posted. And I spent a long time looking at these people ramming the ships up onto the uh, mudflats. And, and the views were videos from all different elevations and you could see, you know, how, how far up onto the, the mudflat the ship got and all this kind of thing. And almost the first thing I noticed about the Ever Given was that it is just rammed up there so much further than any of those deliberately rammed up ships were at, at the wrecking yards. And, so, it, and then when you add the fact that it's fully loaded as well. So, um, so the, ships, what, the, ships, the ships go up the canal at a walking pace because the ships that's what, that's right. there all yeah, the time, yeah. right? It's not, it's not, yeah, this is not yeah. the first ship that ever got grounded in the canal. The, 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 yeah. um, no, this is definitely 
I was going to say not right, but I think it's definitely right. <laughs> not right. right. But the, the, but the thing even, is, even so, though, I mean, you know, to, whatever it is, almost a quarter of a million tonnes at walking pace has got the most phenomenal amount of um, momentum at any rate. Um, and uh, yeah, what are the banks of that kind of like? Are those banks really... It takes, it, 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 full speed, it takes those things seven miles to stop. To, to stop, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what are the banks of the canal like? Are they just uh, they, sandy? They're just sand. Is it very yeah. soft? Just, it's just sand. It, it's just it has sand. to be dredged all the time. And, right? and a, friend, a friend in Egypt yeah. told me that there was a storm that day. I, I just got a, oh, yes, a message. They're talking about... I um, you looked at the school. Like, were, I couldn't see anything. No, but we, we don't really know because they told me that there was a sandstorm now. I'm not saying that it's there's a cause of causality between the two events yes but it's, 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 it's you know I, did, you, did you see the dick pic the, the yeah yeah but the, 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 I, I, I mean i've just, seen the edge of the Suez canal and it's it's sandbanks there's a few little places places mm. where there's concrete but if you look at photographs um, satellite photographs even you can see that <coughs> on the edge of the of the Suez canal there's people growing stuff like this it's just like earth and sand and there's no it's it's you know there's nothing there's hardly anything hard there um it's just uh, no no I, i'm it's puzzled i know nothing about this but i'm very puzzled about this event so so what, that's why uh, I uh, on what, that somebody might have done something because so, the thing so, is so what, i think i think it's probably uh, a state actor and i i, I presume it's um probably the one with the square head. Um, it it could uh, it could be Puba because I I I saw trending on uh, Google Google Trends is that is that oh I'm I'm too to my um so so wait I must I must have another version open somewhere. Hang on a second. I've, I'm hearing an yeah, you're echo. breaking up. No, you're, no. you're not clear. I, I'm hearing a big echo. Can you hear me? There's no more echo now, but there was earlier. Okay, okay. So yeah, well, obviously, uh, maybe there was a bit of surveillance kicked in there. <laughs> but yeah, I think I, I saw trending on, on Google Trends that uh, the server message um, message blocks smbs which are things in microsoft <laughs> which are a little bit vulnerable the maritime industry is tremendously vulnerable in terms of it they're, they're an easy target and uh uh for, I, I thought it was very very strange that the guys in china they all you know was the only region that had a big spike <laughs> in searches recently for smb and so yeah this um this there's this thing called ghost SMB. I think it's, it, it might be that. And, uh, you have to find out whether they had Microsoft um, things on board. On the so they should have then switched off the the engines, the port or starboard engines on one side or something. And no, then... I don't know one. No, what what I what I expect they did is uh, it's pure speculation. But I expect they they got it up to full speed and then jammed the the rudder hard. <laughs> So, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but you know, also the other thing that doesn't fit is that you you would normally hear something like they would pin it on one of the the helmsmen or whoever was on watch, and you would you would hear you know like Exxon Valdez, you know, oh the helmsman was drunk and that yeah. and you was mm -hmm. like <laughs> you never heard it. nobody was fired, nobody was just like you know it's uh, yeah, that's that alone. It. it's absolutely diamond of a spot to do something like that yeah. because something is going on top of the already messed up supply chains all around the world because of COVID. They're all going to have to go around Africa and that's a disaster, isn't it, for costs and for piracy and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. but there's, there's so many actors in this thing, it's hard to tell who, who it is and what their motives are, but there is a growing um, bunch of guys who you know, watch Assassin's Creed a lot. <laughs> so there, there are so so basically when when activists talk, and especially green activists, they're on the left, and they 
they don't see the big underbelly of this beast. But there, there are a lot of actors that are run the gamut from guys doing insurance scams in China on ships um, to state actors to uh, to activists that are, you know, putting Uncle Ted's dream <laughs> into practice. So, so there are huge numbers of forces arrayed here. <laughs> but you see, it, um, on, on the green side, they don't yeah. see it because they're all street activists and they, they don't know that all of this is going on yeah. under the waterline. Just to go back here to what you said about the, uh, the um, captain, I think, that was also interesting because normally when that kind of thing happens, the first time people, first thing that happens is we want a scapegoat. Uh, the Egyptian authorities have just arrested the captain on suspicion of blah, 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 you know, and yeah, a, a yeah, massive Egyptians, investigation has... Would, yeah. yeah, the Egyptians would... Yeah, but no, but all, all that's happened is the captain has said, oh, there was a bit of a storm, and and the, that kind of vanilla story is is all no, that there the, is. It, it, it's all um, wrong. The, the, the whole crew would... I mean, this is yeah, freaking Egypt. Whole, <laughs> Egypt, you, yeah. you do anything, yes. they'll, they'll stick you in Abu Ghraib in the hull hole somewhere. It's like the, the, these guys are not pacing yeah. around the deck after they do that. This this has big repercussions for Egypt. They, they would, you know, haul them off and make mincemeat out of them. But the... This is it. But the other thing was to the... The um, ship owners to pay up or something, you know? But yeah. I mean, there, there's the no way you, the, uh, you go and do this, and you go, "Oh yeah, well, sorry about that, guys. Can you help me get it?" <laughs> and then the other thing that was yeah, really suspicious yeah. is they sent a US team out, and it's like, "Okay, yeah. <laughs> I've got the picture." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, what what fascinates but the other thing is, look, is, you know, I mean, it's so bad. It, it, can you imagine that, like, if if this was in the 1930s or 20s? You would have real reporters and speculating on. I mean, like, look at the the, the wreck of the main, you know, in Havana, and what all the newspaper articles and the conspiracies and the intrigue and analysis. And now nothing, zero, zero, zero. You think yeah. seriously? Have we got this dumb? <laughs> but we have. <laughs> Even the other thing is, right about the silence on if, this thing because it's an enormous thing and. I did look at yesterday a bit. I went through the different media. Sometimes I, I check. We're trying not to get nauseous. And um, yeah, no, nothing. There's tiny, tiny. There's no deep. Uh, I don't know. I know. I know. With COVID, it's difficult to travel. Getting into Egypt is tricky, and that part of the canal is quite far, far away from Cairo. And but I mean. Yeah, that silence. I, I, I don't. I don't understand it. Well, I do in the light of what you oh, said. Oh no, I understand it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. the repercussions of this, I don't think people realize what what happens behind the scenes. If uh, for you can't just start sending all these ships around the around the Cape. For one thing, um, you know they're not they're they're not budgeted to take on all the extra fuel oil to go around the Cape, and they're not insured. So you could you could theoretically bring down Lloyd's or something or, or make Lloyd's very rich by or, or bankrupting, you know, Maersk and these, these container lines. Because if they diverted all ships around, around the Cape, they would probably have to reinsure them and it would cost them so much that it wouldn't be feasible to do it. So it's most of them, I think, would lay furlough and are waiting for it. But if you think in terms of like the fresh goods and unrefrigerated stuff that's just going to shit in it, you know, you can't, you can't really. Well, they've got uh, some of those ships are supposedly got animals on at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you yeah, know, I'm just in looking, time. looking into, um, yeah, I was looking into some of the figures, you know, and I mean, a ship like that, um, you know, they were talking it's somewhere getting towards 400 tons of fuel oil a day to run that thing. You know, and you 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 look at all if ships like that have got to go around uh, the long way. Um, you know, just fuel costs, let alone anything else. Um, but also, you, you know, you get when you get to a machine that is that vast, it's almost half a kilometer long. Uh, I, 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 one that. thing I didn't do, which I should have done, is look at the Baltic yeah. Dry Index. So the 
if you have a look at the Baltic Dry Index, it's the um, it's the cost of actually hiring a, a a dry goods vessel. So, so if okay. if if the Baltic Dry Index suddenly peaks, and it should, because you know all these every everybody's you know booked these ships to to carry their goods around, and if they all delayed mm. somewhere like you know in the sewers and the med, then um, it throws everybody's supply chains out and should drastically raise the cost of shipping dry goods because, you know, basically the, there aren't containers to ship stuff in. So if you see the Baltic dry index spike, that would be interesting. There'd be repercussions from that. The Baltic dry index is a very good thing to watch. Just, just in You know, this could be one of these... Um... This could be one of these events, a little bit like when the first news of the virus came out, and, and you know, nobody said much, and, and we we're going to contain this and all the rest of it. And but then it kind of was suddenly everywhere, and uh, I just get yeah, a feeling well, that this is one of these <laughs> stories that, that that everybody's thinking, oh yeah, it's just there, it's just in the sewers canal. But I, I, but I, I can see the potential. What is the percentage? I mean. Okay, we talk about an enormous traffic uh, going through the Suez Canal. Um, we talk about Egypt losing six or seven billion a year. But what is the proportion of, of marine, I mean, of trade, 30, 30, 30%. container trade that passes through the canal? Do you know? 30% of the world's trade. 30%. Okay, thanks. It's huge. It's huge. So That's enormous. What would be really funny is if. Um, if the same thing happened again in Panama, and then then you would see like Stephen Colbert and all the liberal media saying, "Oh, you know what a coincidence!" <laughs> yeah, but that's you see that the, the Suez Canal is mainly. I mean, it's Europe that's there a lot. It's it's uh, in in the chain and the supply chain that's going to be hit because America. Pana uh, it, I I don't know what amount of of uh, I've no idea. What amount of, of shipping will get through the Suez Canal to what countries? But it's mostly for us in Europe where things are coming from Asia. Yes, yes, yes. that's that's yes. why that's yes. why it has a very anti of flavor to it. Um, you see, I, 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 I I'm echoing like crazy. If somebody oh. Yeah, so so yeah, the. Um, oh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, if it is China, it was it was like Ch this. This is one of the last routes from the Belt and Road that ends here in Piraeus, and so uh, that's the major trunk from the Belt and Road. So this this cannot be good from Ch China. So it looks like it it you know it seems to me that it might have been from China, just from a few things from cyber cyber news, but that doesn't make a lot of a lot of sense um, because I think China's the you know suffers most economically from this. Um, it 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 has a strong flavor of anti serv or otherwise it has something to do um, with uh, with Iran. But the actual the actual ship is um, you know it's it's a European company, so it's not it's not it's not a Chinese ship, uh, which is suspicious. But anyway, it's, it's it's devilishly hard to figure out what's going on. These kind of things you find out decades later. But um, and the the other thing is the repercussions. You won't be able to tell. You know, there'll be all sorts of repercussions like food prices and delays and stuff. And you, you'll it'll be respon This will be responsible. You'll never be able to connect them up. It's just too too murky for information. But but anyway, the, the 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 takeaway lesson is ships are extremely easy to hack, and um, you know, yeah, <laughs> we, the um, yeah this if you look in at what Uncle Ted was saying, uh, yeah, this is exactly the kind of thing. But what it, it, it the the lesson here is just how damn vulnerable the whole system is. That's the takeaway. And then, yeah, it's, this is, um, yeah, that's, uh, sorry, I, I wanted to go back to just to the beginning, just to add the point too that that supposed sandstorm 
you know, I mean, a 50 kilometre an hour wind is bugger all. <laughs> you know, they're talking about that seriously running this ship off course. And I mean, <clears throat> not even the, 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 the made up story has got no credibility anyway. Uh, so, um, so ships don't, they don't just, um, you know, rock up at the canal and drift through like it's a Sunday afternoon. There's an incredible mm. amount of, of bureaucracy and they all have a pilot and they're not one pilot from the bottom of the sewers to the top. They have like, you, you will have five or six pilots for each part of the canal. <laughs> so the, the idea that, um, you know, oh, it just got a little bit blown off course. If there's sandstorm yeah. or any kind of risk, they, this, is, this is one of the crucial areas of the world that they don't, they don't fuck about. They don't take risks. If there's the slightest risk, yeah. they, they wouldn't let a ship do. So it's all nonsense. I mean, if it, you just go, I mean, okay, there's a there's a bridge here that's kind of strategic for Greece. The, the amount of rigmarole you have to go through to go under that bridge, <laughs> for me, to sail under that bridge. I have to call the guys up and I have to drop the sails and go through an engine and you're at an exact point, he'll tell you go through this pillar and that pillar. And it's like, is that that's just a big thing in this huge strait? You know, it's 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 a, like this is one of the most you know strategic areas in the world. It is it is um, you know it's defended to the hilt, and it's, it's like, it's, but they make it sound like a whoopsie daisy. It's like it's it's just not right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that's the thing that got me. That the whole it, it was such a such a flimsy it was just so bloody weak that, that it was almost inviting you to, to sort of say, Hey, go and look at this a bit more closely because it's it, it was just such a thin story, you know. Oh a fifty kilometer hour wind and, and, and the captain says, you know, caught the ship and, and uh, you know, oh my god. <laughs> it's just um, but, but where's but Tintin, the other and side of it, he... Tintin and Slurry should be down there investigating and writing salacious stories and having dispatches every day on yeah. the intrigue and what it could possibly be and getting the and what do we get? Nothing, nothing. It, it means that they 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 don't actually get revenue from you know how juicy a story is. It's like they get <laughs> revenue from, from advertisers and they don't get it. I also think that the general public, a lot of people around me, and I've talked to a few people about this in the last few days, young people, um, I don't think they grasp the importance of the Suez Canal. I don't think people are interested. I think there's this COVID thing going on. I think we're going to get used to see events like that happening more and more, whether they're inspired by Uncle Ted or whether they're, you know, cyber attacks oh, or whatever. Whoa, whoa, we're we're in the world. That, and nobody's going to say anything. Because there's just there's just this general apathy and ignorance. Um, uh, you know, if you if you ask a lot of people, even in Europe, what's, what about what's, where's the Suez Canal? Um, why is it important? Um, how you know? No, I mean you you would be you would be surprised. And if you want to go to your local uh, stupid uh, IKEA or I don't know IKEA it's European but supermarket or or anything that you from Asia it's coming through the Suez Canal but nobody cares I think nobody cares uh, they they will shortly because oh they will yeah yeah about to kick them right in the crutch the the but what it will translate to is a lot of unrest because they they gonna get say shortages and shops they're gonna get all stuff like that and then they just gonna be angry without any understanding so it's all to the good if, if you're an anarchist because all of this translates to anger against the state so they've got into a situation where you know they're infantile and big sister and the nanny state looks after you and when nanny doesn't deliver on your porridge uh, there's going to be temp temper tantrums all over the Western world, but they they won't understand the deeper thing about what's going on. But the days where people can afford to, you know, just do woke stuff and be so willfully ignorant, um, those will dry up quickly because soon it, be it becomes part of your survival to know what's going on and predicting the <laughs> where the next things come from. So yeah, it's basically. It's good to talk about these things now because 
the shock and horror is uh, is going to be awful when this you know reality catches up with all these kids. But anyway, while we while we yeah. are on that subject, we should be talking about all the wonderful bottlenecks around the world, and so that you know all these idiot kids. Yes. I had one of them on Reddit telling me, "No, you know, civilization's never going to collapse because we have the internet now. It's kind of a, a base foundation. Once once a civilization gets to digital connectivity, it can't fall below that because you have all the knowledge and stuff." And I was like, "Dude, are you fucking stupid?" It's like the internet goes it's out. It's even more fragile. And he says, well, the grid's not going to go out. And I said, yes, it is. I'm, you know, my buddies are going to take it out tomorrow, <laughs> you stupid idiot. <laughs> and then all these kids are going to be on their phones going like, how do you get the grid back up? And it's like, oh, why haven't I got internet connection? Oh, you didn't know that that needed electricity, you moron. So basically, the yeah, the power grid, when the power grid goes down, there's uh, serious repercussions if it stays down for 72 hours. They're just uh, It'll take a year to get it back up again. The, but, um, um, but but let's talk about all these bottlenecks. So so there's the sewers. Yes, can, I've got one. The Panama can yeah, it, it's, it's, no, the one that was last year, wasn't it, where, where the Straits of Hormuz were, was... Yeah. Uh, I, I can't remember the That's detail of the story, but I was just... I, yep. I, I think that was could have been a practice run or a practice demonstration that might have led to what's just happened uh, in in the sewers. It might have given somebody an idea. I think. Yeah, um, it, basically uh, the Persians, the, the the Persians have been their ships have been hammered, so they're trying to get oil and stuff to Syria, and um, the you know the Israelis have been knocking out these ships. And so, you know, that goes underreported. It's basically international terrorism, but, you know, some international terrorists are, um, you know, more favorable than others, apparently. So, so that doesn't get reported, and there's no outcry against that. But then you get this kind of thing, which might be retaliation for that and that. Yeah, the, the, the thing to look at is, is communications, particularly oil. So the Gulf of Hormuz, but the Straits of Malacca, the China Sea, uh, Panama, all of these these things are, and increasingly the Arctic. The, the, you know, in the the summer, going going through the Bering Straits and going north, and is increasingly becoming strategic, and they're moving the military up there. But anyway, uh, the undersea cables are tremendously vulnerable. So you know, they're probably I don't know twelve cables or something under. Uh, no, actually, probably a lot more these days, and under the North Atlantic. But they're all very focused in in one place. And Africa is connected to Europe um, with fiber optic cables, just just one or two. So the the a few years back, ten years back, a ship pulled up the fiber optic cable just by accident with its anchor, and Africa was cut off for the internet for about a month. So that was, um, you know, nobody knew, um, knew about but that. But that was, I mean, I think you made the point somewhere, maybe it was in your book or somewhere else, that those, uh, that vulnerability was is being sort of artificially created by governments wanting to to uh, surveil everything. Yeah. You know, they want those cables yeah. to go through a choke point so that they can uh, get all the information. Uh, yeah. So they're it, deliberately... Uh, Gibraltar, Gibraltar, and uh, the the UK, the Echelon surveillance. So Echelon is is surveilling all the traffic, and they made um, all the internet traffic comes across. Not uh, they didn't want it to go through Ireland to Europe, which would be the obvious thing. So they they made it come um, to Northumberland, and then uh, through through this uh, big surveillance site there. Uh, yeah, did you see that thing I just posted? They've got this thing, NCF now. Bo Bojo's made a attacking cyber force, the national cyber force, <laughs> which um, also they just, went they just, uh, done, This has just been done in Australia in a big way, the, the, yeah. uh, just a few months ago. Um, and that this is enormous, sus suspiciously enormous budget going into this. Yeah. And they've sort of said they're doing it, and and uh, um, well, they're sort of saying stuff and not saying stuff at the same time. But but just just looking at it from the external factors, you, you can read back into what the story behind it is, I guess, which is is what you're just saying about the uh, 
what Boris Johnson's doing, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, when you're talking about concentration of these choke points in terms of uh, digital communications, that if you have a look at Gibraltar, uh, they all funneled into Gibraltar because that's, you know, Africa, Africa's connection and, and Britain won't give up Gibraltar to Spain because of its espionage potential. So um, when when I landed in Gibraltar uh, a, a few years back, um, the, it's just filled filled with these young English guys and you know in the clubs and stuff. It's about you know it's like ten guys to one <laughs> one girl, and so yeah, I got chatting to them and trying to do my usual thing where see, play the little game always plays like how much sigin can you get out of an ass and. Uh, yeah, they're all in signals intelligence. Uh, they, the whole of Gibraltar, everybody sees this big rock. I think it's a big rock. It's, it's actually a honeycomb. It's, uh, it's just hollowed out completely with all these facilities. But uh, uh, if, you, if you know that, you just, you know, if you look on a marine chart, they have all the cables listed. You, you can you can go and look at uh, Navionics charts or something like that, <laughs> and you know they they're all there in plain sight. Uh, for you know, in incredibly. So if you go on like Google Maps or something like that, then they pixel out strategic things, but they can't really do that on a marine chart because they have to they have to warn shipping that like oh, there's a big you know marine cable and or a pipeline or something like that and so but it's it is it is all there all sitting and vulnerable it's it, there's no security and obfus obfuscation that, that that the system has so if you most of the computing for example is done in amazon web services now and in and alibaba the two biggest cloud services are alibaba and amazon web services and and the, all the government stuff is largely now on amazon um, and the, the facilities are distributed all over the world in hard sites. But you can find them. <laughs> they, they all out there. They all, they, they, you know, they have power backup and stuff, but not that long. They don't, they're not, their power's not backed up for, for very long. They have a lot of solar and stuff. But, uh, yeah, um, yeah, if you go on the, the dark web or the you know the onion ring and stuff it's like all of this stuff is is open open knowledge so the, so i don't think the average person realizes they think of the state as hugely powerful in that but it's 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 not it's 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 very very uh stretched extremely thin it's all a, a big paper tiger when when push comes to shove the, <laughs> the state is 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 uh, you know they have nuclear weapons and you know, aircraft carriers. But if you go and have a look at like the Oregon coast or the uh, Washington coast, it's like they have one um, national forest guy who's the coast guard. Just one guy for the entire co coastline of Oregon. <laughs> they might have changed that, but certainly in 2001, they had, they had one guy guarding the entire coast of Oregon. <laughs> The only thing is, I would say, um, saying about those underlit sea cables, is that I think Facebook, I saw a program a while ago, Facebook are just investing like, trillions probably in all this new infrastructure. So they're rolling out new undersea cables, apparently. I can't remember where. I don't know if it was in the Atlantic, but you know how they're trying to. So it's not all, you know, still all that ancient old state apparatus. It's some of it is going to be quite new. Um, and I can't yeah. imagine Facebook and Google and Amazon just letting it. They'll probably have some drone ship monitoring it or something. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. No, 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 no. They won't have that. What The way they tackle it is they, they don't guard it that way. It's too expensive. The, so there's a lot of uh, impetus, you know, a lot of the stuff in space like Starlink and you know, Musk and stuff getting uh, uh, internet linkings, and and also the Bitcoin guys they're getting Bitcoin satellites and stuff. For but the the way they tackle it is with redundancy. So the entire point of the internet was to have a redundant network. So the internet came about because DARPA 
was looking for a way uh, to survive a nuclear attack during the Cold War. So it has a lot of different pathways. Now, there are a number of things to note. One of them is the network is a scale-free network, uh, and it also mimics all the cities. So if you look at cities and towns and villages and stuff, they also are a scale-free network. Now, the number of properties, if you look in terms of uh, that kind of um, mesh network, is uh, that one of them is that then there aren't any single choke points, but um, you know that you only need one in 20 nodes, so 5% of those nodes, to be taken out and the whole thing goes down. There's, the network's too sparse. That's the one thing. In, in terms of uh, saturation and things like that, if 50% if you, you, if of the nodes get, get overloaded to capacity, it'll, it'll tip into a new new phase so so all of these things are you know are are really vulnerable even though they have a lot of redundancy uh, built in but in all cases if you examine these closely no nobody designs these things for resilience it's just you know capitalism is 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 really cheap in this area and uh, you know everybody is so worried about profits they try and cut corners so although they make these uh, networks as robust as possible, they will make mistakes. They'll make, they'll be huge blind spots that even they 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 don't see because they don't. Nobody is ever given the job to say, "Go and make sure that Google's network is absolutely secure," and then there are no uh, vulnerable points that could be taken out. You know, they don't they don't think that way. So. Uh, it, they they think in in terms of um, you know statistics and broader gathering and surveillance and stuff and you know so so what I mean is if you think yeah. of it in terms of the ants and the grasshoppers the ants know the vulnerable points if it's like the office space there's this guy in the you know sitting down in the cellar who's been completely ostracized by society. He has a lot of time to sit down there and think of the vulnerabilities on the system. So yeah. he knows stuff that no one else would know. It, and it's, uh, it's, sorry, it, yeah, it's it's like um, with, you know, where these now, all these organizations, Facebook and all the big corporations, they'll, they'll pay handsome money to, you know, uh, white hat hackers to find vulnerabilities like bug bounties, won't they? And um, you... you you can imagine every, well it's it's always easier to be the attacker isn't it than being on the defense in these systems or the sort of line of work that you used to do you know in computers and systems I, yeah, from, my understanding, from my layman's understanding it seems that it's harder to to be on the defense than being on the offense and looking for a loophole or a, a, yeah a yeah yeah you only have to find one loophole but you have to defend everything yeah so the the thing is that those white hat, uh, black hat things is is a, they're not really done as much as they've ad they advertised. What what those most things because it's capitalist America and capitalist world really, they those kind of things are ass covering. So they they're not really like a military establishment. If you had a military commander that whose life was at risk, you would make very sure that his um, fortifications were secure. But if you're talking about an executive, they just want to cover their ass. So they'll go to Kaspersky or something like that and, or, or, or some bunch of charlatans and they they just want to be able to say, we we covered our ass, we made sure we were secure, we got a check in the box <laughs> or we signed up to the security service or we did Gartner or Forrester. <laughs> but they, they're not sincere about security. They're just sincere about covering their ass. So again, that's a big vulnerability. Um, and in, yeah, and they, they, they love to um, offload it offload security to third party. So, you know, you can make a career out of a consultant as long as 
a very good one and lucrative one, as long as you understand that you're the fall guy. They're just looking for a guy to indemnify them and take the fall when there's a vulnerability. That's all. They don't want you to do anything other than that. And so, um, yeah, so so the system is is uh, has has huge, huge flaws in it. But I'll tell you, one of the things where they're making the biggest mistake known to man is they... Um, they, for a long while, they've been getting, they, they used to get hackers and just throw the book at them. By 2000, around 2000, at the turn of the century, they did the normal totalitarian thing where they just ratchet up the penalties. And, you know, the, basically, if, if you're caught hacking or caught on a government server, they just give you the death penalty. <laughs> and then after a while, they started to realize, well, this is not a good plan. Well, they started to get hackers and turn them. So they would get the guys. You can see this in the, the there was some movie that, that that did this. I can't remember what the movie was. It Breaking Bad, or was I can't remember if they were. Uh, no, uh, what was it? The, was it the the eighties one where they um, they hacked in and Later. sent missiles? It was it was like a war game. Oh no, thing. not the war game. No, no, I mean the thing. Oh, I know what it was. It was House of Cards. Oh, so okay. House of Cards, they had all this. All of that stuff was accurate. What the guys are doing is because they have such draconian legislation, you know, legislation, such draconian penalties for hacking now. I mean, you know, child molestation, you you might get five years, but, but minor hacking, 30 years <laughs> minimum. So it gives you the idea of how, what a threat this stuff is. But but the thing is what... You're like Charlie Brown. Remember him, the Bitcoin scapegoat guy, Charlie Shrem? Yeah. He got, he's in there for life. <laughs> you know, because he, he was the guy who, who allowed... You know, what he, he, you know what they got him for? Was basically uh, uh, betting drug dealing. So they said, yeah. you know, people are using Bitcoin for dr <coughs> drugs. <coughs> so Charlie Shrem changed. He was hosting the servers or something, wasn't he? Yeah, so. but... but but it, it wasn't even it wasn't even one of the guys on the servers. It was one of the guys on the servers, some you know, transacted um, with somebody else. But it's basically two parties removed, and the prosecution said, "Well, you must have known that that you know your your exchange was using for drug dealing." And they said, "Like, yeah, but everything is." It's like, you know, you think the banks don't know that, you know, money's being taken out of an ATM and used for a drug transaction on the streets. And of course they know. They're laundering. I mean, HSBC and stuff, they're laundering drug money. All the banks launder. If you go down to Tampa or Florida, the banks are like fucking Scarface Inc. They're basically a large chunk of change comes from drug running. But they never get prosecuted. Yeah, the FCA are going after Nat West. That came out in the last couple yeah, of weeks. They're going, now the government are going to sell all the shares in Nat West for money laundering. Yeah. Because, you know, they, but, but, but it's not the cost of doing business. They hardly get a rap on the hand for the billions they get. But, but yeah, we, we, oh, what I was saying was that they would get these the, the hackers, though, and they would turn them. And then they, they decided, well, the best hackers are black hat hackers because, you know, the white hat guys are like goody two-shoes conformists. And they hang around with the nice crowd. But the, the black hat guys are the really seriously knowledgeable ones. So, that, you know, they would, faced with these draconian penalties, they would offer them a, a plea bargain and then they would, you know, say, come and work for the NSA. Well, that's a huge fucking mistake. If if you're a linear thinking Mike Pompeo arsehole, then you you kind of think um, very linearly. You think oh, everybody's like me and thinks and you know America's wonderful and stuff. And I just have to put you on the right place, show you young man how to be patriotic, and give you a fucking pittance of a salary. And now you're completely turned an American. It's like no, of course not. They these guys are as resentful as all fuck. So basically, they're building up armies of people that are resentful. So if you work in the NSA, what the hell do you do? Of course, you can network with all the other guys <laughs> that think you were stiff. So they've been building this up for a long time. And then they got bitten rather badly um, in, in 2015, 20, yeah, 2015, I think. 
uh, they, they got bitten badly by apparently one guy uh, who's uh, called, called the Shadow Brokers. And, and he, he destroyed the NSA. <laughs> the NSA was fucked after that and still is. The NSA, they, they still haven't recovered from, from the Shadow Brokers. But that's a guy inside who knew all the tricks of the trade. He, he sold the entire NSA <laughs> cyber toolkit <laughs> to some unknown buyer, a state buyer. And uh, yeah, sold it first for Bitcoin. And then I think the final transaction was on Monero. But you saw Bitcoin went from like two cents <laughs> and when we went up to 70,000. The reason was that all these guys, all these state actors were bidding for the toolkit. So the... Um, yeah, that completely passed <laughs> no notice for the, the mainstream. But yeah, the, the, that guy, the shadow brokers, I, he's still out there. And I believe he's, um, uh, yeah, I better not say too much. But the, I, I believe that, I, I certainly believe that the 2016 election was hacked by, by him. <laughs> So, in essence, he basically put Trump in the in the presidency as a joke. It, it, was, it was like giving a finger to the system because Trump, Trump himself was was surprised as anybody that he got elected. And the reason the reason was he wasn't supposed to be. It was an upset, and it was it was a hack. The guys have since come come out in testimony and said that it was a hack. They've admitted in congressional testimony. It's, report, it's reported, not widely reported, but kind of softly. You, you can see the transcripts and that. The guys come and say, and then that one of the guys was actually confronted. I can't remember who he was, um, but, but one of the senior military guys was, was confronted saying, like, you know, was it actually hacked? Uh, not by social media, by the voting machines. And, and he said, yes. And they said, well, you know, why don't we do something about it and go on the attacking? And the, the guy said, look, we, we can't do that because, um, you know, we've only had one election hacked. And America has hacked 30 elections in other countries. So we don't want to start getting too hot on <laughs> hacking elections because we're the guys who've benefited out of it most. Which is an extraordinary thing. You would think that would be plastered all over the new but it all gets buried. But I, I also wonder if guys like that are on the inside and they're just blowing smoke in these congressmen's uh, faces because you know they 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 have immense control through through all of these things, and then they're doing psyopses all the time, and and this is the the consequence of uh, the war in Iraq is in. You know, 9/11 is, is is Thucydides said. You know, in ancient Greece, he talks about the war came home uh, because Athens went to war against Sparta, and it was a huge bloody war. And you know, it was you know the same thing as America. It was better to go and tackle them over there on the Pel Peloponnese than have them come in. <laughs> you know, we have to deal them on home territory. So. So they send, you know, Athens sends all its soldiers into the Peloponnese War, but you know, they they get traumatized, they get PTSD because running around on a battlefield with blood and guts and stuff is brutal on those battlefields, and they come back um, with PTSD. When they come back, then they cause trouble. They cause tr the soldiers returning tr causes trouble for Athens. So Athens never kept the war away because it came back in the PTSD of the soldiers. Now America did exactly the same thing in Iraq. Is these vets have come back extremely fucked up. The guys that were in Fallujah and all of these things. So, you know, for, first of all, they're all dealing in drugs and stuff, and then they all come back to the states. The war doesn't stay in Iraq. All the atrocities, the 500,000 children that America killed, all the drone strikes and all, the, all of the Abu Ghraib and all of that shit, it doesn't stay in Iraq. It comes back in the heads of all these young guys. So, so if you look at the capital insurrection and that, those guys are vets. And uh, they, they want revenge for, <laughs> for the system. And uh, yeah, that's that's the the war comes home, and that's what we're seeing, and that's and then what these guys are doing, like Michael Flynn and all of these guys, they 
they're doing a psyops. They're doing a psyops. They're hacking the election. Democracy ended fucking decades ago. It's just a result of cyber wars fought at elections. And so, so um, yeah, so we're in one huge psyops and, uh, you know, QAnon, to use a keyword, is is a big psyops. And so, you know, all of, I, I think XR is also, but, you know, at the, at the end of the day, as I say, well, we, we got to step up to the plate and start doing psyops um, and uh, and turn it around because ultimately um, the state loses. The state needs uh, harmony and concord, and it's just such an easy target to to sow discord. So we need to like you know goddess Eris. <laughs> Let's go back to the Greek mythology and look at Eris, uh, but. We need to do an Eris, and um, it, it's easy. It's I think we'll win. I think we'll win because uh, the the state requires everything to have law and order, and we just need discord. So we'll win. Yeah, you that's a really great summary. Uh, sorry, just to quickly say about the XR style. Do you think that? So you, you obviously state actors trying to. Basically, the end goal being that then harsher um, draconian rules come in for, you know, uh, cracking down on people on the street, you know, locking people up in their homes, ties in with lockdown and things, or is it something, I don't no, know. No, they, no, I don't, that. no, I don't. So Pretty Patel is just a psychopath, and so that's the natural inclination of a psychopath. I don't think they planned it for the lockdown because they can do it very easily. They can just do it with one jihadi attack, right? So what the what they do is they get um, they get local talent. They like talent scouts in the music industry. And so they get local talent and cultivate it. So if, if you're there like Gail Bradbrook and uh, Roger Hallam, they're the salt of the earth. There's no way that they moles or they speak double agents or anything like that. They, they're the salt of the earth. What they do is they they infiltrate the organization and, and fuck yeah. with their heads and they don't know it. So the so so Roger Hallam and they they talking to people like Chenoweth. Chenoweth is a state actor. So yeah, well, the same as like they did with the Black Panthers in the seventies. Um, yeah. yeah. So I don't know why Gail and Roger didn't go instead of going reading all this civil rights bullshit in universities. Why didn't they go and read up on <laughs> COINTEL ops and all of that? That would be find out what happened to Occupy and how that was steered. And, but, you know, the, 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 I think there was 5,000, something like, I heard something like there were 5,000 undercover agents just from one agency, I think from the FBI, in Occupy. <laughs> it must be like every you know, third guy, or maybe like, you know, there's one activist and three, <laughs> three goons. But that's the kind of... You know the things you're talking, but you see that their aim is not to um, not to shut the guys down. They're not to do what you know, ban XR or, or de get draconian. It's to bleed off resources. So look at all the the resources and time and uh, stuff wasted um, in XR in stuff that's absolutely ineffectual. So so pretty Patel might. You know, she's concerned about policing. And so she, she might come in and then twist a few MPs' arms to <laughs> make the Bobby's lives easier. But um, yeah, I don't I don't think she she was strategically planning these ops. They they're done at an entirely different level. They're done undercover. So but yeah, the it's it's very naive. I mean XR is a success because it's taken a whole sway, the whole generation. It's the the peace movement or the CMD uh, in Britain of our age. So it's dragged all all these <laughs> cupcakes, into, all these snowflakes into into the movement and educated them. They started off thing, you know, saying singing "Police, we love you" and stuff like that, and now have realized that they've been fucked over. This is huge progress. I mean, don't don't knock this. This has been a great success. <laughs> so um, yeah, they they miss. 
like move on to the next level. But I think the next level is to go underground and start doing sophisticated psyops. You can't an above ground organization like that is just you know, it's basically just for green tech and stuff. The, <laughs> the funders, I mean, the funders are banks. Gail went around to HSBC and stuff like that. It's like it's like whoa, that's tainted money. You can't take that money. But they didn't know. They they like they're innocent. So yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it's the XR is not not finished. I mean, the it's it's just it'll carry on. It's it's um, this this is this is how it starts. It goes from education to education. But what these people are being educated in is the the guy the the state and the guys in charge of the state. They are psychopaths. They don't they don't believe it because you know they they so glib. All these guys like. Biden and stuff. They're such polished, glib assholes. I mean, guys like um, Obama and stuff, they, they just, ah, oh, you know, in some ways I almost prefer Trump because he's, 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 he's more honest. He's more, he's more blatantly a psychopath. The other guys are just hidden psychopaths. So it's, it's worse. Can I, can I, uh, can I ask you a question again? Because you, were, you started earlier um, about bottlenecks. Now you're talking about we we're talking about the Suez Canal. We we're talking about underwater cables. Um, I, I've heard in various meetings we've had a few mentioned, but I think it's something that I'd like to go a bit deeper. I mean, I'm interested in those in those complex, well, um, you know, they're yeah, they're because they're vulnerable. yeah, they're very vulnerable in uh, LNG, liquid natural natural gas. So there, there's there's a tear story waiting to happen. So what? Well, that's the kind of thing you mean, Sophie, like that. Yeah. So so if you, uh, it's good to look at study um, each one of these sectors and see their vulnerabilities. So one of the things with LNG is that, and a lot of other commodities, they they have trading hubs. So they're very few trading hubs, hubs in the U.S. where suppliers actually send the LNG and it gets traded and then taken to distributors. But it's all concentrated in, in one place. It's, it's remarkable. But that's what capitalism often does. It's, it concentrates things into, into one place. But um, so, you know, a gas distribution terminal like that um all the power stations are are linked to that and you, you know if, if those ever go out the grid will go down and never come back up yeah so but uh this yeah this if you if you study network maps and stuff um you see there are lots of uh, vulnerable things but exchanges commodity exchanges uh, and things like that are are hard to distribute, and and in terms of LNG, the an LNG carrier, a liquid natu natural gas freighter, is is really three atomic bombs, <laughs> just basically <laughs> all in one freighter. They may have three cylindrical tanks on them, under very very high pressure. If you look at the energy in in one of those, the the energy is equivalent to like Hiroshima bomb so that so they have double walls and things on on those um, those tanks but I I can't imagine you know LNG terminals are all over um, big capitals and cities because what happened was they the energy industry changed Greens, Greens and activists don't really know this because they're clueless, but the energy transition happened already. There isn't going to be any more energy transition. There's not going to be a transition to solar panels. And wind. Because energy transition happened, what it was was coal to LNG. And it happened um, you know, around about uh, 2005 or, or thereabouts. Uh, and there was a mad scramble for liquid national natural gas and the, the price of energy plummeted. And the reason was that the Pennsylvania field was discovered to have almost unlimited amounts of natural gas and nobody 
knew that, and suddenly America woke up to the fact that there was a very strange story. It was basically there was an engineer, mining engineer, who who wondered. He just wondered casually one day, you know, how much LNG is there in the Pennsylvania field? Everybody knew it was a lot. There's standard formulas and stuff that the guys run, but nobody did it because Pennsylvania field is old and it's, you know, it's people are looking in new areas. They didn't have any focus on that. It was considered old hat. You know, any journey, it was kind of like, you know, everybody knew it. It's kind of, so to say, it's kind of like Australia. Everybody knows it's down there, but nobody cares much. The Pennsylvania field was that, that kind of, um, that kind of thing in the energy industry. And then this engineer ran these figures and he almost fell on his face. He said, hang on a minute. We have enough energy in the Pennsylvania field to run America's entire energy economy for more than a thousand years, maybe like 2000 years. And so he looked at it again and again and again, and couldn't find anything wrong with it. And so he started to tell people and they had the same reaction. They said, this has got to be wrong. And then uh, eventually they came to the conclusion, no, he was right. <laughs> it's almost unlimited LNG. So what, what happened instantly was the whole world pivoted <laughs> to, to liquid natural gas and, and moved off coal as soon as it was economically viable to move off in, in terms of power. And that's where we are. So then, but what happened is all the cities around America, they started putting in massive LNG terminals and bringing in these LNG tankers. Now, if the public knew, I mean, say in London, I think it's somewhere in the East End or somewhere up the Thames, they keep them away from a big center like, like London. But, you know, if the public knew the power in these things and how vulnerable they were, I mean, I don't, I don't know how much they test a, a tank like that, but I, I can't imagine they would take an RPG or anything like that. I, I you know, I, in terms of the... I mean, they, they're not Hindenburgs, they're just, they, the energy density is extraordinary. Just go and Google it. Um, so, Hugh, so, I'm wondering that the, the, the tanks are probably double walled just for insulation. Um, because for of safety, the for safety and, and because yeah. they're cryogenic, right? So, the, so basically what, what they do is, here's, here's the end of capitalism right here is to transport it and make it more economical. They, they lower the temperature of the gas so that it liquefies. So that's why it's liquid. It's, it's a huge amount of, of gas that's brought to a temperature, cryogenic temperatures enough to lower it. So part of the reason for the double walls is, that, is to lower the temperature. But they, they try to keep secret the configuration of these things, but it's, it's uh, and the design of them uh, because of security reasons, but you know you can easily find pictures and, and uh, drawings. I think with those um, some of the ships. Uh, I mean, I didn't. I haven't gone into it, but I assume that uh, if anything happened to the ship's engine, uh, the refrigeration system would stop, and that would be pretty exciting too. Because no, uh, you not wouldn't sure be able to on that school. I'm not sure if they're continuously yeah. refrigerated or do they need refrigeration equipment? I thought once they're under I, pressure, it's kind of like your it, it's exactly like yeah, your, your I'm not gas. sure. Yeah, I think it's like yeah, your maybe gas. you're right. Yeah. In other words, once you've uh once you've uh reduced the temperature and, and liquefied it, as long as you can maintain the pressure, it'll stay there. Yeah. yeah, I was under the impression they still had to keep refrigerating it, but I might be wrong. I'm not sure. They, about they, that. I think yeah, there might be certain parts of the the piping and stuff like that. There, there might be bits and pieces that they have to have refrigerating, but I'm not. It wouldn't be difficult to find out if the, the ships need, you know, refrigeration equipment. I, I doubt it because that that would be really 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 unsafe i mean i kind of feel it would make it so unsafe that it would make lng unviable as an energy source but well, well yeah. nothing is stopping the madness anywhere anywhere else <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Well, but, but i mean the thing is though um i wouldn't recommend anybody just goes out and Monkey wrenches is one of these things. The thing, the way to think about them 
is um, kind of the way XR was thinking with, you know, that Earth, um, truthteller.earth. Uh, you know, basically having a whistleblower report and trying to tell people how vulnerable our system is because the general perception is that it's really robust. But if you think it's better than attacking these things, it's, it's better to just know that, that that's the vulnerability. And, and then uh, you can see other systemic risks. So one of them is, uh, so, so then once you know that's the actual point, it's, it's thinking a little bit lowbrow to thinking, okay, well, now you do an operation against one of those things. You said, what would be the results? It, it would just be a spectacular and um, I, I doubt you could, you know, stop them moving or anything like that. It would, um, you might raise the public awareness, but you'd terrify people and it, the mortality rate would be high. Uh, but, the, you know, think about it in terms of, say, insurance. Because all of these things exist and insurers and stuff would know that. If you have a look at the insurance system, you, you could... Uh, see vulnerabilities, say, in reinsurance and stuff like that. Um, a lot of these things, like Lloyd's and stuff, are, are pretty shaky un underneath it all. And if you found one reinsurer, like, like ING, ING was a, was a bottleneck in the 2008 financial crisis because it was the the insurer for all these people that had derivatives and there's no way it could cover them. So, so you, so for example, you could stop the movement of LNG much more effectively. For example, if you took out the insurance industry, because all the regulations and that, so you can't move a ship without insurance. And, and if, if the, if, if the insurer went bust, a big insurer went bust, um, those ships would stay in port because they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to, to, to um, they, they wouldn't be able to cover the regulations and move. And, and so, you know, that's the way to think of it. But in essence, I think the system is most vulnerable in the financial realm. So I, I think that if you, if you follow that line, you follow all the lines of the most sensitive dependent things, it's capitalism. So, you know, where the boss is weakest of all is in his, his bank account. So all these guys are frauds, right? And the whole capitalist system is a huge fraud. So if you take any guy from Trump to Hearst or any of these guys, they're all really bankrupt. They're just bankrupt in such spectacular style that, <laughs> that nobody can call them on it because otherwise they take down the whole world. But all these, uh, you know, like Deutsche Bank and all these guys, they're in exactly the same position. They rapacious, unre unrestricted capitalist whores. And so they've completely overextended themselves. And so that's where their vulnerability is. If you study them, you'll find a, a weakness. And then something like, you know, why I'm so keen on a dead strike and silver squeeze and stuff like that is, is somebody like JP Morgan could take the whole house of cards down, the whole damn thing. And they can't patch it up by printing money or using MNT. It was... Uh, you know, so, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I honestly think if you wanted to bring the whole system to a dead stop, I think you look at things like a silver squeeze because all of them are running that, frauds, right? And then that would bring, bring, bring home the fraud. And yeah. But yeah, what's going on with the silver? Because I had echoes from London and Paris and different places where, small people now can hardly buy coins and bars of silver that it's totally uh, <clears throat> there's been a kind of a clamp down is that true i don't know i'm i've no no there's scarcity I, no there's um, scarcity because uh, because nobody has any trust in the system they've uh, they've done the the military lost 1.3 trillion it just went the us military 1.3 trillion the gdp of america is like 14 trillion the, the U.S. lost, like under the sofa, 1.3 trillion. Oops, sorry, misplaced it, don't know where it went. So, uh, and then, so, you know, that, that's the kind of fraud and, and abuse in, in the system. And then, you know, they, they just did 1.9 trillion. I think they're doing 400 billion every month. They're just pumping in. And everybody knows this. 
So they, you know, the reason why the stock market is going up is because it's just a monstrous bubble. They're just, you know, flushing money into the economy, but it, it, into assets, not into the high street or anything like that. So it's just massively inflating the stock market, but and the bond market, but the nobody's fooled by this. There's no single trader <laughs> or bond broker that's they terrified because there's going to be a reckoning. Just know everybody's you know handing around this lit match, wondering who's going to burn their fingers. But they're all ready to to drop the match and run out the room, and they all know that everybody else is <laughs> so they're playing chicken, and uh, and and it's where this all comes down to reality is some real commodity that they can't fuck with like gold and silver and they all know that and that's why there's no physical silver because <laughs> the preppers and everybody gold bugs they're all sticking it under the mattress and then these big funds like slv um they jp morgan share the bullion banks they don't have any they they've passed out this gold and silver a hundred times so they're doing a massive fraud, and there's no silver left in London. <laughs> it's all con game. So they're running scared of an accounting. Everybody's running scared of big accounting. I actually think if there's one thing that I know you don't agree with cryptocurrencies, but if there's one thing it has done, it's woken up like Gen X and the millennials to the fraud that's happening. And so that is a bonus in one way. But it's crazy. I mean, you think what you say, I think, isn't it like quarter of all US dollars that were um, were uh, that are in existence were created just in the last year or something ridiculous. It's crazy. Yeah, that's right. Stag I mean, it, it, yeah, in terms of the acceleration of the great acceleration, uh, the, like half the CO2 was done in the last 15 years or something. Something like that. Is it? It's extraordinary numbers. I think it's, yeah. What? What is it? I think it was thirty, actually. Since, since oh, you're half uh, in the, the last thirty years. But, but yeah. Yeah. See, what yeah. nobody will say is the c word. It's basically you're not allowed to say what everybody knows, and that's it's China. It's all freaking China. But but China's a basket case for debt too. So it, it really is debt, debt, debt. Uh, the, if, uh, if, if the hoi polloi, us, just did a strike on retail banking, the, this, uh, you know, there's 1.6 trillion in student loans in the US. There's, there's uh, you know, Fannie and Freddie and shit, shit uh, almost took the system down with uh, 2 trillion or something, but if if you got minor defaults, if, if students got together and defaulted on fifty percent of the loans, that that would be the end of this show. And the the thing is with the debt strike is that if uh, if the great unwashed realized the power that they had in terms of debt, rent, um, default, and tax default, if if they did it and got a big reaction, got you know there were big repercussions. Um, it's kind of like Wall Street bets. They can kind of smell blood, and they they kind of realize that the the system is vulnerable. What they'll do is repeat it and ratchet it up. So it's it's kind of like you know the peasants, where you know one of them comes forward and throws a stone, and then everybody sees, oh shit, these walls are all made of paper, and then as soon as they all realize that. Thousand stones. <laughs> so, so the the thing about a debt strike is to just put a chink in the armor, and and then um, everybody would be like, "Hey, this dragon has uh, rubber teeth," and then the system's really bad because everybody will will pile in. You see that there's there's a lot of latent potential, I think, for. Um, mob mentality of you know there's growing resentment and, and revenge and if if one person makes makes an inroad where, like for example like Wall Street bets and everybody goes hey you're kidding you know that works this uh, the the kind of um, uh, network effects and bandwagon and bandwagoning that will will kick in 
and it'll go extremely fast, kind of like the the Arab rebellion. It'll take take the establishment really by surprise. Oh, have we been? Have I been talking for a hell of a long time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just fun. No, that's brilliant. It's it's really good. Um, but we've been going for like three hours, I think, altogether. Oh shit! Probably. I'm sorry. Okay, well, we should wrap it up. Do you have another question? Well, we take a um. No, I think I, I was I was interested in going into that the business with that ship. I think that was I think that's. I don't know. It's just by in intuition. I don't want to sort of emphasize it too much. I just think it's go it's going to be a trigger point for something major. I just got this feeling about it. That's why it was interesting to go into it for a while. So, um, yeah, it's if you study networks and stuff like the aviation network, there are lots of bottlenecks in aviation in terms of insurance and refueling, provisioning, all that, that kind of thing. But you know the 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 thing is to is to study it and study it and study it. So so what happened in World War Two was there were these stories like the uh, the Schweinfurt thing about the ball bearings and stuff. But what where those things come from is a masses of amounts of intelligence gathering. So uh, the the U.S. made a lot of inroads in against the Japanese, and there was. Um, it was purely because some alert GI uh, found a maintenance book in, in a in a garbage can at an airfield in a, that was captured from the Japanese, and he had the sense to 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 just um, send it in to military intelligence. They looked through that maintenance thing, and they they could tell that the guys were running out of um, hinges and and ball bearings and you know rubber and stuff. But they, they looked at those materials and they said, oh, you know, the cheapest and easiest is to hit this material like rubber or something. And then, you know, they found that, well, all the rubber production is only like three sides <laughs> and then easily take them out. So it's, it's that kind of thinking. And then, then so it's kind of a, like a lot, a lot of research and then a lot of, um, you know, uh, a, a very little in terms of uh, operational expenditure but yeah but as you're but, saying a lot of the information that's but even uh, even there you can be, even there sorry even there you can you can also uh just the fact that you you have the strength capability and you announce the fact that you're going to do it is, is is powerful so you want to get to a position where where you do nothing but the threat alone sends terror through the system that was one thing that uh, you brought up in the talk with Lear earlier, and I don't know that um, that um, it got through to her that um, the the um, the threat itself is enough. Um, the threat of violence or collapse is enough. And but you're right that at some point somebody might be called um, on the bluff. But um, I don't know if that got through to her that. Um, you know, the threat of violence could be enough. Yeah, the, the major thing is the, the, you know, if you walk tall and carry a big stick, the chances of you having to use it are vastly diminished. So if, you know, if you have a threatening posture, the, the chances of you being called on it are, are there but low. If, if you are called on it, you have to react immediately so that you leave nobody in any doubt that you, that you are serious. Um, I think that reminds me of what you said about the debt, stri debt strike in one of your earlier videos um, last year. Um, the fact that even the project is there and that the possibility that people could default could be enough to bring down uh, the system without yes. having to. Yes, it's, it, it's, I remember it's kind that. of bad psyops. To, to actually expend lives and material in an operation is actually bad psyops because it's all psychological. I mean, you just, it's its kind of unethical to use people's lives for to, for a psychological goal because, you know, if you if you know your job, you could, it's, it should be all psychological. And, and so the, the net effect is uh, to try and achieve the same thing with psyops. So, for example, Exxon now is talking about COP26. 
and th these guys are kind of divided because there's some clueless kids that are like, well, this is our final year and we must go to COP26. And, and they don't know that it's a complete cop out and COP26 was always funded by the oil industry and they're just there to make sure there's no climate action. But a few people and the young kids in Exxon, they figured that out, that basically it's all a, a put up job and a farce. And so, you know, I'm saying, well, boycott the bastard thing. That's the best thing you can do. Um, and so that makes a statement and stuff. But what, in terms of psyops, the cheapest thing you can do is something like, you know, loudly announce an operation, like to say, well, we're going to, we have infiltrated. COP26 in Glasgow, and we're going to spike the water or something. We're going to get LSD, and we're going to spike it so that basically we're going to, you know, uh, and if you get that in the press and everybody will debate the, whether that's wrong or right and the ethics of it and blah de blah de blah and, uh, and then you do nothing, but you claim that you did. So then, then it makes the whole thing a farce. You say you... You get all the clips out of the COP26 where the guys are on the podium. You see, look at this guy. He's on acid. Look at him. We got him. <laughs> and then they'll all argue with him. You did get them. When I... But you see, the effort is nothing. The effort is absolutely nothing. You haven't even done anything illegal, I hope. <laughs> but, but you see, the, the, that's what PSYOPs is, is, is you, you're really showing that you're using their weaknesses and their weakness in cop 26 is it's a farce so so but the weakness is that it's a farce that it has to be credible so if you just make it utterly in, in uncredible which is to claim that the you know cop 26 everybody was on acid and you could see it well it's pretty difficult to tell whether somebody was on acid but i bet you you could get some footage out of the normal cup which would make people wonder and then uh, you know that that's that's your victory because you've got through to the public um, that you know young people have lost interest in the cop. I mean, I don't think there would be a COP twenty seven after fiasco like that <laughs> because why would they do it? it the, everybody's seen through the farce. But you see now, uh, think what Exxon is likely to do. They're likely to go up there, have a whole lot of people arrested. You know, basically, they're reinforcing that COP26 is legit. And it's like, don't do that. <laughs> do the opposite. Try and think of ways where you can delegitimize it. That's science. Uh, well, we better end it there. Yeah, that was long. <laughs> yeah, I yeah that was great. Uh, we might want to talk about it a little more. Um, just about that um, topic of psyops. I think um, I don't know. I'd be interested to know. Could, is it something to start out small, like within yourself, and then I don't know, like make it grow or yeah? Maybe uh, yeah. Like yes. So the so I'll, I'll, I'm doing a video on it. I'll do. Oh, I'll do a video. Well, I have. I'm editing it down now, and I um, uh, because Stephen Hazen didn't didn't want to be interviewed. I, I thought oh, yeah. I'd, get, I'd get the TED video and just comment on it. So so basically, okay. I turned into a big hit job on it, which is kind of unfortunate because you, I, I I mean all these guys mean well and stuff, uh, you know, and I think yeah they they're just liberals and they want to protect society and they think that's the right thing to do, but um, yeah so. I, it's kind of un unfortunate to use them as a as a punching doll, but what the hell? <laughs> See how it turns out. But anyway, I I'm, I also want to use that to to introduce people from XR into psyops and and how it's done. The the, the greatest danger for psyops is that people will get um, squeamish because. You can't do psyops without fucking yourself up, too. See, all, all the guys during the Cold War, all the guys that were fight, fighting the clandestine war and doing doing the, the great game, they all fucked themselves up in the head. They, they, didn't, they didn't know what... what they, they touched completely with reality. And, and you have to, because it's like, it's all smoke and mirrors and 
and so yeah they all went psychotic it was part part and parcel of the game but it's it's a good thing it's a good thing it's what we need operation mindfuck yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> robert anton wilson and those guys yeah <laughs> yeah it's it, it's it, you want to fuck with people's minds and uh, and uh, as cheaply as possible. So it's it's a battle of wits. It's, it, 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 all this is, the entire thing, is a vast psychotherapy so that basically we can all resolve ourselves into one superorganism. The human organism is, is really just on the cusp of being a, re, uh, you know, a eusocial superorganism. And... The reason what's preventing it is all these individualists and <laughs> egos and stuff like that. But tipping it over into a uh, superorganism, kind of like in the Matrix, is what it's all about. And it's all and to do that is is pure psychology. So you don't want to wreck people's lives and make widows and stuff. But you know, the rules of the game says you have to be prepared to, otherwise you, you know. Otherwise, you will have. To. Hugh, did you say, did you say something last time about expanding the ego to? Um, to I'm just thinking about what you said about this. Yeah. Meaningless. Yeah, things. yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's the same as what you're just saying, really. That 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 uh, to create the superorganism, you expand the individual egos out to encompass everything, or all of the, all of the individual egos. Um, yeah, it's the, it's the boundaries of self. Yeah, it, what we we're all discovering is yeah, that you're all one mm. self. Uh, so, yeah, so yeah. the same thing that yeah. the same thing you do with your alien cortex as an individual, it, you do with the meta alien cortex. The same thing is happening with the meta alien cortex. But the meta aliens, just like you, have to go you psychotic to actually, you know, rewire your brain. The entire mm. superorganism has to go you psychotic. So the world has to go nuts like, like this. It's it's not not a bad thing. <laughs> it's a birthing process. But the more nuts yeah. and sooner you can make everybody go nuts, the, the quicker you'll get them to the other side, right? So you, you, it's kind of like a quick birth. You don't want to string it out. And, and what people without knowledge will do is string it out. That, things like geoengineering and stuff are bad for the planet, but they... they Terribly retrogressive for people's psychological process, and that's probably a good place to stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds good. Enough. Thanks, Hugh. That's great. Well, thanks. Thank everybody. you, everybody. Thank, Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Right. All right. See you Bye. soon.